Brain AIDS Awareness Month, um, February being the coldest month, it's um, there's a charity, SRUK, that have been really promoting it over the last few years. Um, I got diagnosed with it when I was one. Um, I think it was my first birthday and my parents noticed I went blue and took me to hospital, not having a clue what was going on. And uh, I'm pretty much been living with it ever since. Um, so I have what's called primary Raynaud's. Um, so it's a circulation disorder. Um, it often it affects women more than it affects men. And it usually develops if it's primary for um, girls going through their teenage years. Um, so I did get it confirmed when I was about 14 or 15 that I definitely did have it and I hadn't grown out of it. And on the surface, it just looks like, OK, you get a bit cold, um, more cold than other people. You get um, colour changes in your hands and your feet. But the reality of it is it's actually a lot more painful than that. So there's a lot of everyday tasks that take a lot more effort to do. Um, I've spent, I mean, I've been quite active most of my life, but that's pretty much how to begin with. You're taught to handle it. They go straight away with it's diet and exercise. So try and maintain a kind of like a core body temperature. So not spiking it too much. So a bit like when we do fartlek, you know, we're going fast, slow, fast, slow, fast, slow. Well, that will, that's great for circulation. But when you're trying to maintain a single temperature so you don't cause an episode, that's when it can be an issue. Um, so yeah, so during like my teenage years and my early twenties, I really had to learn to control how much I exercised, what I did, so that I didn't end up having like evenings with just so much pain, pins and needles. Like one of the things I found, it happened in my thirties actually, was um, I'd be sitting on the sofa after a day at work. So bearing in mind, you know, you've done the usual things, you've got up, you've got showered, you've got washed, your dress, gone to work, done your whole day, gone and done some exercise in, after work to keep your body moving. And then I'd sit down and relax and I would get shooting pains going up my arms and my legs, which the most similar thing I can compare that to is, um, you know, if you've had a general anaesthetic, so you feel like this heavy pain going all the way up your arm. And then yeah. it would go all the way back down again, um, which that's actually quite a severe episode. And I was getting to the point where I was having them pretty much every night for about half hour. So I went back to the GP and they were like, yeah, we need to get you on some medication now to try and control that because diet and exercise clearly isn't doing its job anymore. And so I've been on that about two years. So I'm on a calcium channel blocker. Um, so that's definitely reduces my episodes, uh, but I still have to be careful. So I still have to consider, oh, well, when it's the winter and I want to go out for a run, I maybe just go for a gentle run as opposed to trying and do sprint finishes and get my temperature then really hot and then shocking it by getting really cold on the cool down. So you were saying you're someone from one and yep. not till your 30s, you got medication. <laughs> What was the awareness like for your parents at that to say, you know, your daughter's got this? Did they, um, you know, was there support? Was obviously not, you know, you are only just turned 40. So the internet, you know, you didn't have the information available that you did now. What was going through their minds? Um, they didn't really have a lot of support. They were just told, oh, yeah, she'll just get a bit cold. Keep her warm. And bearing in mind at the time when I was diagnosed in the 80s, the it had been Raynaud's had been known about for a hundred years. The GPs still didn't know anything. They didn't tell you a lot. Um, it was only in my say later teenage years when I, like a typical woman, would go to a family planning clinic for contraception and things like that, that I started to learn more about it because there's certain medications you can't take, which includes certain contraceptions. You can't take if you've got Raynaud's because of um, it's to do with blood clotting. Oh, so wow. even my parents wouldn't have known that. They wouldn't have had that support from the doctors to say how to control it. Um, they were told that if I was cold in the evenings, I was to drink alcohol to stimulate the blood flow, which that's now considered a big no-no. <laughs> How old was she then at this point when they said that? 
I was in my teenage year, so I would have been 14 or 15. And they said, drink alcohol. Yeah, like not in it, not like in excess, but you know, <laughs> the doctor's approval. <laughs> but it is now considered that that doesn't help at all. So yeah, there was very little support, and it that lack of support I think continued with me for my twenties and early thirties. So I didn't go and ask for help from the doctors because I didn't think they knew anything. I thought it was something I had to live with. So at what point did it change? Um, it was about two or three years ago and I was just crying in pain every night. The, it went from more than just being cold. It went from regularly having these painful episodes in the evening. And there were like lots of friends that would, who have children. I don't have children, but there'd be friends who had children who would offhandly make a comment and go, oh, I wish I had the luxury to go and exercise after work. And I always felt this isn't a luxury for me because if I don't exercise, so, and it would be things like going to yoga, going swimming. It wasn't always an aerobic style exercise, but if I didn't exercise, I did end up with pins and needles and pain. So I would have to exercise over the evening after work to help keep my body functioning. So I didn't feel like it was a luxury. And then when I was doing that and then still having pain and it was every day, that was when I had to go to the doctors to say, what can I do? I can't manage on my own anymore. Um, and what did they suggest? Um, well, luckily, I'd already been Googling and discovered SR UK, who are the main charity for Raynaud's in the UK. And so I'd seen what medication they were suggesting. And when I did go to speak to my GP, they did, they said, yep, yeah, okay, we do agree it's time for medication if you're in this much pain and they recommended exactly what I had to, and I took with me a printout of everything SR UK had said on their website and they recommended the same medication and at this point okay you know you're later in life are you aware of anyone else around you with the same condition um yes um no one in my family but I've got a few friends who I've discovered have got it uh, varying different levels um the majority of people either don't know they have it or they've maybe got it in a mild form so we just carry on with life as normal you don't it's it's an invisible disease at the end of the day it, so people just get on with it so step forward lewis who you know we're part of and um you know you came to me with the charity saying can we do a virtual race raise awareness yep I was absolutely shocked how many runners have it and how many took part in the challenge and then created a post on Step Forward Lewis Facebook saying anyone that's got it, give advice. And who actually started commenting and the advice that was given. Can you go through like, you know, what people were saying? Like one was scared to even admit that they used a hairdryer as part of the process of calming the pain which sounds funny but if that is what it took yeah it's it's a really weird feeling because there would be times like I still have it now and I'm on medication but if I watch a tv program that's got snow in it I feel cold I and I've years ago some friends talked about going skiing the thought of it terrifies me the thought of being out in the cold terrifies me yeah. because the pain that I associate with cold is more than a normal person who just goes I'll oh, just put a jumper on I need I'm already wearing a jumper I'm wearing a jumper in the summer <laughs> I've gone on holiday that's, that's to a warm wanted, country uh, that's what I wanted to lead to because Catherine a park runner that we both know a friend of both of us who was on episode one of running tales also had the condition Yes, she and does, yeah. She was the first person that made me aware of it um, back in the day because it would be boiling hot and she would be covered. Can you explain that to our listeners? Why, you know, you don't judge a book for a cover when you see a runner or yeah. anyone fully clothed in a, in a baking hot day because they could have this condition? Yeah, I mean, I think the easiest way to explain it is 
during this COVID pandemic, I don't know how many other people, but we've bought one of those thermometers, you know, the one that you just do on your forehead. And an average person's um, temperature is about, I think, 36.2, 36.3. My average temperature, I've noticed through doing this, is 35.8. Now, that doesn't sound like a huge difference, but it is lower. So therefore, I'm going to be more susceptible to any temperatures. So therefore, I'm already feeling, I'm feeling cold all the time. Um, there are, di people, there isn't a one size fits all with Raynaud's, unfortunately. So some people are more affected than others. But for me, it's wind, uh, um, rain, things like that. It feels like, if I can feel it on my skin, it feels like knives kind of scratching at my skin. So that might be what Catherine's feeling. So she feels that if she can feel that slight temperature change on her skin, it will feel like it potentially it's cutting her. But you don't have to, and this is what surprised me since we've been doing this challenge and raising awareness mm. um, and getting the knowledge from SR UK about symptoms and that. It's not just the uh, those that feel cold. You can get it from being too warm as well. Yeah, um, it's... The main thing I was actually on, I listened to their webinar this week and the main thing they talk about is maintaining a core body temperature. So it's the changes in temperature that is more damaging than it being hot or it being cold. But it's more, you're more affected in the cold. But so we get a lot of it more in this country because February is a prime example. We've had one day which is 10 degrees and another day that's minus 10. So yeah. the body can't adjust to that for someone with Raynaud's. It just seems to confuse it completely. Whereas if we were always at minus 10, you'd still get it, but you'd be affected by it less. Yeah, yeah. So um, let's talk through advice. Like someone, you know, that's it, like in your condition that is quite regular. What works for you? Uh, layers works for me so not necessarily wearing a big fleecy jumper but maybe wearing a light vest with a t-shirt and a hoodie on top so that the concept of layering works for me um, I'm not wearing them today but fingerless gloves so or you know just like fingerless mittens so I'm getting blood flow stimulating through but I can still use my hands um, diet and exercise um, seriously I know there are some people that say it makes no difference for me if I'm not doing a regular exercise and I'm talking four five six times a week doing something that really helps the more stationary I am the worse it will be for me and she's mentioned diet like one of our friends one of the runners um she said her husband has found diet helps him with his um Raynaud's as well yeah yeah, what, as much as I love that? chocolate and biscuits, they're not good for me. Well, not yes. anyway, but, <laughs> but what is that a huge part for you on diet? With yeah, I found the heavier I am, the more I struggle. Um, if I have, if I decide that I just need to eat loads of chocolate, it's fine for a day or two, but then. I need to get back and eat healthily again because I seem to when I eat healthily and I keep a lower body fat weight or just generally keep a low weight I seem to ha I seem to manage my symptoms better. So as an extreme case of when you've been really bad with it like I know um you know um you the other day when it was really cold minus yep. you didn't even leave the house go to work because yep, I know, didn't you can get to, Describe us the worst case you've been at and what does uh, shut down in bed? Yeah, um, one of one of the worst cases I had, it was kind of alcohol induced, which is probably not a good thing, but we've all gone through it. Um, I don't get a beer jacket. You know, when you hear people go, oh, I'll have another drink and it'll give you your beer jacket. I didn't get that. I had the opposite effect. So I felt, so we were out drinking one night. I thought I had enough clothing on, but I clearly didn't. Um, I wasn't in like a skimpy dress or anything, but you know, I was just jeans, a top, a light hoodie or something. And I was drinking and then I felt, I actually felt my blood 
rushing through my body and I was going hot and I was going cold and I was going hot and cold and it went on for about an hour until we got myself back home and then even then I was under a blanket with people hugging me getting my body temperature back down for about an hour what because you just went too hot um I went too cold initially but I just couldn't I just couldn't control my body temperature and that was so yeah it was just my blood vessels just didn't know what to do so the alcohol was thinning my blood making it move quickly but I wasn't warm so we had to bring and so I was just in bed shaking under a blanket with people trying to with people trying to warm me up so was it a case my, of you recover from the warmth or getting the alcohol out of your system to get you um well, I think recovering from the warmth first and then learning my lesson about not having too much alcohol. <laughs> uh, talk about cheap day, you know. <laughs> you, are, you, you know. <laughs> so um, we've been, you know, month and we've had this 28 in 28 days um, challenge for yeah. February and raised awareness and, you know, it's great that you were saying you went on this webinar and even the charity SRUK was was surprised how many attended the webinar. Yeah, I think there were over 200 people attended the webinar live. And I don't think they were expecting that at all. So it, it's definitely yeah. more common. You know, I'm surprised how many runners in our small mm. group, you know, and we're a very small running group that have it. Yeah. Yeah, it's there's as I did mention earlier, I've got something called primary Raynards. There is secondary Raynards as well. So that's something that develops later in life. And it's usually the cause of either another illness or a medication. So that that is a potential of why we're suddenly seeing more people with it, because it could be that they haven't had it all their life or it's been dormant all their life and something else has brought it to the forefront now. Wow. So since doing this as well in February, have you, have you realised, you know, raising the awareness through the group that, you know, it is more talked about now, not just amongst yeah. us, but on social media? Yeah, it's definitely more talked about now. It used to be something that I told people I had and would have to explain it and then them just kind of like go oh right you just get a bit cold whereas now people are actually understanding just like a lot of other illnesses or diseases that this is something that is painful this is something that you're living with and oh I actually think I know someone that might have that because they're displaying those symptoms and oh I didn't know you could get help for that so so leading on now because it is called running tales I want to talk yes. about your running journey so you are a late runner Yes. And the reason why more I want to go on to your running is because we've been running once a, a week during a lockdown. And um, you have been saying that this is the first time you've been running through the winter months. Yeah. Um, I didn't start off with running. Um, I can actually tell you how I got into running in the first place. So essentially, I like to do charity challenges over the years like not every year but I would do something and go if I want people to sponsor me I want it to be something that challenges me so that people feel that they're giving for an actual reason not just oh you know some, you do this every year um, which actually weirdly started with an abseil um, I don't actually have a problem with heights as such but I do have a problem with getting down from them so when I signed up to do I think it was 120 foot free fall abseil at the devil's gorge which um <laughs> it, it was a little bit scary um and from that i was like okay left that a couple of years i was like i want to do a new challenge and i saw pretty muddy which is part of the race for life series um advertised in northampton now i don't run i don't i used to live in london and i didn't run for a bus running is not something i did <laughs> And I turned around to a few friends like, they, oh, I'm planning on doing this. Would you support me? And three friends turned around and said, yeah, we'll support you. We're going to do it with you. Okay. Two of them are runners. And I was like, yeah, I, I, I don't run. I'm going to be walking it. And they're like, okay, yeah, yeah, that's fine. 
So we get there, we're all dressed up in our pink race for life, pretty muddy gear. Um, and it's a very silly obstacle race. Uh, you know, we're on space hoppers and things like that. Um, and the two runners made us two non-runners run most of it. So it was around Abington Park. Yeah. <laughs> and from that, I was like, you know what? This is actually quite fun. I quite like this. Um, so then I decided, OK, I haven't run the whole thing and it was 5K. Let's do the Couch to 5K app that everyone's talking about. So I was doing that either at lunch times or after work around the race course. And I think about halfway through, I got a little bit bored because I didn't enjoy the stop starting bit. Now, I did mention that earlier with my Ray notes that the stop starting, the going fast, going slow is what can cause an issue for me. Yeah. And so I was really struggling with the stop starting. So I gave up the app and then just said, this time I go out for run, I'm going to increase it by this many minutes or this many meters until I get to 5K. Um, I actually did manage to get to my 5K in the winter. So it was a January, I think 2017, and it took me about 45 minutes. And I'm very yeah. proud of that because I did that without yeah. any stopping. And so from that, I was like, OK, I'll sign up to park run. Because I want to like have this thing that I can say, well, you know, I've done a 5K and now I've done it officially. Yeah. And I was like, yep, yeah, okay. And I think that was, it was probably February. So I did that. I was a little bit scared at the start. It's very crowded at the race course. Um, but I got through it. And I had some friends cheering me on at the end and I got a little bit of buzz. And so I'm like, oh, I like this. Okay, I might do this every so often. And obviously the problem was it was February. So I didn't do it for quite a few weeks because I was cold. Yes. And then started going back again, I don't know, probably March, April time when the weather got a bit better. Um, and I, my time was better than the previous time I did it. So then I was like, OK, well, OK, I'll go. I'll go again. I'm not going to make it part of my life. Parkrun is not going to be part of my life. <laughs> Famous last words. Yep. Ten weeks later, when I've got 10 PBs in a row, <laughs> I was like, yes, I'm loving this running thing. Actually, I don't like the running thing, but I'm loving beating my times. Um, so that's where that started. But then I struggled and I stopped in the winter because I don't like the wind. I don't like the rain. I can just about cope with the snow, but as long as it's not snowing at the time started again the next year in springtime and then I decided you know what I need a challenge again so I signed up to the 10k rough runner obstacle race okay <laughs> because I was like well if I can run 5k I can run 10k without stopping true oh, sorry I can run 10k with stopping so that was my logic I had no clue about really what these obstacles were <laughs> so they're things out of like total Oh, was it total wipeout ninja warrior i that day rained i fell at almost every obstacle it's in oxford every time you're running you're running sideways up a hill it took me over three hours i was miserable it was the worst experience of my life <laughs> i got to the end we had to um, run up the travelators out gladiator Yes. So they do it at like three different speeds, which I failed all of them and had to go up the one where I just laid down. It takes me up to the top. I mean, I got a photo, which is absolutely amazing, where we do a jump finish and we look really excited. But I was crying. And then somehow I turn around and go, you know what? If I take this running stuff seriously and I train, I'm going to do it again next year. OK. Which I did. <laughs> I, beat, I took an hour off my time. I managed almost all the obstacles and any ones that I didn't manage, I got further. I met some amazing people on route. So we were all helping each other get out the pools because they're like over six foot high, the pools. Yeah. Um, I'm For those people that don't know me, I'm only five foot four. So trying to get myself out after you've been like running around and falling in obstacles all day long is quite exhausting. Um, and I think from there, I then just start going, OK, I've got to start this running thing. I've got to do it more than once a week at Park Run because I won't stay fit otherwise. Um, so we started doing twice a week. Um, and so I started noticing an improvement in my running and my times. I was quite happy with myself. Stop again at the winter. And it then takes all spring to up, well, get spring and summer to get back to normal again. And then lockdown happened. 
Yeah. And I went, the only thing I can do is run. <laughs> I'm not allowed to go to the gym or do anything else. So out I go running three times a week because I've got time to do it now. I've got nothing else I'm allowed to do. True. And then I think that was when I was a bit more in contact with you. And you said once we were allowed to do activities, you said, well, why don't you come and do fartlek? And so I was like, OK, I'll give that a go. It sounds a bit weird, but all right. And it was I don't know what time of year it was like June, maybe. Yeah, it was June, about June, July, when we were all yeah. out in groups of six. Yeah. And so I actually and I really enjoyed that. I was like, OK, it's just breaking up what just going for a run. And then this really has been the first winter because I'm now used to running three times a week. I mean, some of my weekend runs I was going I was running for 10K. So I was increasing my distance as well as the amount of time I was running for on the amount of days. Um, and then it's I think I ran all the way up to December. I think I only missed one or two runs, got yes. to January Christmas time absolutely fine, which is what often happens with me. I think I did a couple in January, and then that's when I said to you, you know what? If it's um, SRUK is uh, uh, running this No Raynards Have Raynards Awareness Month, let's see if I can run in February. It's been quite a mild winter. Yes. And the, first, <laughs> <laughs> and the first, first no. <laughs> yeah, the first week of February was brilliant. I was like, yes, I'm doing this challenge. So 28 miles in 28 days. In seven days, I've done nine miles. And then the second week of February happened and I couldn't leave the house for four days. <laughs> the day that I did leave my house, um, I, had, I could actually feel my toes losing circulation. Like I could, as I'm walking, just to my car I could feel like I could feel that I was losing feeling in each toe individually I was like I can't leave the house I can't go out for a run I was like but and I was so devastated but then I realized this is the reality of what I'm trying to get out to the world that that simple little thing is I couldn't leave the house I couldn't go to work I couldn't go out for a run I couldn't go out and do the food shopping I was a prisoner in my home because the temperatures got too cold and no amount of clothes were going to keep me warm enough outside of my house. Well, so it does really dictate how you live your life. Yeah. Well, by the weather, you do yeah. rely on knowing what the weather's going to be because if it is extremely cold or extremely hot, you have to prepare yourself. Yeah. I mean, even like when I go for a run with you of an evening I need to pack my clothes in advance so that I can make sure I've got the right clothing I mean we've got had a bit of a joke before lockdown with some friends from Park Run where they would make a joke was I turning up or not because if I got from my house to the race course which is like a three minute walk if I got there and the wind was too high and I could feel it through my clothes I'd go back home again <laughs> That's it, sad, yeah. It, I would go, I can't run in it. I won't run in it. So it's that simple little thing of making sure I'm in the right clothing to be in that temperature at that time. It takes planning. I have to ask, does it affect your mental health? Yeah, very much mm. so. Yeah. And the running helps you, yeah. obviously, deal with it. Yeah, I think in general, I think exercise does help with it because it just releases those happy chemicals, doesn't it? So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, so getting those endorphins, feeling like you've achieved something and that you're being healthy. Because otherwise you sit on the sofa and you're wrapped up in the blankets and all I, when I'm like that, I all I want to do is eat chocolate. And then I hate myself for eating the chocolate because it's not helpful in the long run. No, no. Oh, that's, you know, that's, it's, I didn't realise, like, I, I know, oh, when it's extremely cold or extremely hot, you're like, okay, we've got to change. But to the extent that it, it can stop you from going out and just doing anything and feel like a prisoner in your own home. I know yeah. we've got COVID and a lot of people feeling like that, that are isolating at the moment. But when we're out of COVID and just yeah. generally you, you and others that have this can feel yeah. like a prisoner. Yeah, very much so. And as I said, it's just, it's a basic thing of the, you might, like when people say, oh, shall I just pack an overnight bag? Because we're just going to go on a spur of a moment trip. 
my overnight bag is a small suitcase because I don't know how I'm going to react. So it could be the middle of summer, but I've still got to take clothing with me in case I get too cold. Yeah. So finishing this off, how would you say running has helped you and, and the condition that you've got overall? Uh um, overall, I actually do think it's helpful. Um, I know when I discussed with doctors that I was going to start running, they were really concerned um, because the being outside is often what causes the problem. But learning to know when to push myself or when to just do a gentle run, it's helping my mental health. It's helping my general fitness. And when the concept is be healthy, being healthier is less work for my body to do its thing. Well, then running helps that because if I'm exercising and I'm doing an exercise I enjoy, I'm going to keep doing it. And I do enjoy the social aspect when you're allowed to be sociable at park run because it was nice meeting people and people cheering you on and you feeling like you're just feeling good about yourself and wanting to encourage other people because, yeah, it's just... It's, yeah. yeah it's just because <laughs> yeah just because <laughs> uh, if, you just, if you can just highlight to everyone then the charity that has supported you and people should go and have a look i know on twitter there we are s-r-u-k yeah so it's um yeah it's s-r-u-k so that stands for scleroderma and raynaud's uk um they're quite I, they are the uk based charity so they've got um, you can just search them on Google. There's Facebook have got a group called Raynard, Raynard's Disease, I think. Um, so that's a community as well. So SRUK have got a forum. There's other Facebook groups as well where everyone's sharing their experiences. Um, and there is loads of information about the, what different treatments or management that people are using or taking part in to help. Thank you.